Hi folks, this is a quick overview of some of the ways that you can try and stop malware um, from doing damage to your systems. Uh, and just to start with, some terminology has recently changed within the community. So previously we referred to blacklists and whitelists as lists of things to deny and things to allow. Um, but there's been a move just within the last 12 months uh, or so actually to um, update the terminology to use more inclusive terminology. So now we refer to them as allow lists or deny lists and there's a few other ways that terms that people use. Um, but the traditional approach to dealing with malware is actually just to try not to run it. Um, and so basically we just try and run software that we trust and we try not to run software that we don't trust. And there's broadly two ways you can do that. You could do that with a deny list or with an allow list. So with a deny list, basically you try and detect things that you really don't want running so that you detect the bad software. And with an allow list is the opposite approach is that we have a list of software that we do let run and we don't let anything else run. So those are the two uh, approaches. And then how you sort of uh, identify the software um, can be based on signatures. Uh, and so usually sign signature based detection is used for deny listing. So you, you create a signature that represents a specific piece of malware. So you analyze uh, an executable and you create a signature that will then detect that malware next time it comes up. Um, but unfortunately, this will always be one step behind attackers because if you write some new malware that doesn't match the previous signatures, then uh, you know, you'll be able to get it to run and the anti-malware software will miss it. The very simplest form of a signature-based detection would just be to create a hash of the program. So we could use MD5 or SHA-1, SHA-2, SHA-3. For example, um, to create a hash that represents that executable file, and if that specific hash comes up again, then we know to uh, deny it. And then there are other approaches that have more fuzzy hashing or more clever ways of um, writing signatures that will um, detect categories or, or mutations of a specific piece of malware. Anomaly-based detection is uh, again, it, it's often used as a denial list so that basically what you do is you monitor the behavior of a system or a network and when you see a piece of software that's doing something that you don't expect, uh, then you shut it down. Um, so for example, you could monitor the system calls that a program's making and if you have monitored them in the past and then suddenly a program's acting differently, that might be a sign uh, that it's malicious, or if you've got a piece of software that suddenly exists on a system and is doing things that you don't normally do on that system, again, you say that's anomalous behavior and you can shut it down. The problem with that is it's prone to false positives. So as soon as a program starts being used differently, it might suddenly trigger these rules, or um, maybe you can also have false negatives where you have a program which is doing something malicious, but it's aware of the fact that you've got anomaly-based detection in place, so it's just careful not to trigger those rules. Um, what you can do often for allow listing is use digital signatures. So if you have a, um, as a developer, I might have a private key, which allows me to sign the software that I create, and I publish my public key, and that will allow people to check my code signing signature matches um, without me giving away my private key. They can check that I wrote the software. So that's the way a lot of the um, allow listing approaches to digital signatures works. Um, and you, um, things like Microsoft App Locker, Microsoft Software Restriction Policies, Apple App Store, Linux software repositories, they all use digital signatures in the way that they work. Um, and it's the way ActiveX used to work as well, which is ways that you could embed native code in websites, but it was um, terrible because basically every time you went to a website that had ActiveX, 
it will prompt you, do you trust the author? Um, and, you know, you can imagine why that landed. People would say yes, and then suddenly they're running software um, with full access to the person's computer over the internet from visiting a website. So thankfully nowadays web browsers don't do that. Um, you also have relatively new approach, which is reputation-based security, so that when you see some um, a lot of users using a system, the first time a particular piece of software comes up, you can sort of flag it. And so you can start to trust software because more and more people are using that software. Um, and so if, um, you know, when a new piece of malware comes out, it can start to be det detected. Um, but you have the same problem where as soon as you've got some new software, it can start triggering the, um, the rules. And so, you know, it can be an issue. The bad news is that all of these approaches often fail. So you've got digital signatures and certificates that failed to accurately reflect the actual origin of programs. So VeriSign once sold a Microsoft code signing certificate to a still unknown third party. And denialist techniques often fail to detect most zero day uh, malware. So new malware that we don't have, um, we haven't seen before. So you can just imagine a targeted attack. If I had a specific target that I wanted to attack, I could write a brand new piece of malware that did something a bit differently than what's been used before and it wouldn't be detected by uh, the majority of uh, anti-malware software. And some of the things that's happened recently is the move towards using um, access control techniques that are more restrictive. So you can use sandboxing, for example, uh, to restrict what the programs are allowed to do. It makes a huge improvement to the amount of security that's in place, um, but there's still complications around who gets to define what the policy is. Um, but it is being used more and more. So mobile devices like Android, for example, have sandboxing kind of baked in to the way they do security, uh, which is a big improvement. It's less ambient authority, so you're just giving less authority to the programs that you're running, which is a positive thing. But no matter how restrictive it is, if it can do something, um, then that something can be mis, uh, can be done in a malicious way. So it will always, you know, in the foreseeable future, they'll still have a problem with malware. Uh, we have to be careful where we get the software from and what we trust that software with in terms of what information we give it, what privileges we give it, uh, and we need to be able to analyze software to actually check whether software is behaving the way we expect or not.